Cool. Anybody else? Let's just do it real quick. Make sure we got this. What's the answer to this one? Gamma. Gamma. And a gamma happens a lot for scale type parameters. It happens all the time. So gamma is the answer. Let's just remember what a gamma looks like. So gamma has this form. And we've been touching on this in the homework. So again, I've been saying in a review session, gammas are the key. You know, chi-squareds are gammas. So constrained gammas. So types of gammas. They're part of that family. Exponentials are part of that family. So gammas are the more flexible distribution. It's kind of like the super distribution for us. So gamma, alpha, beta looks like this. And I know that we haven't done this exactly explicitly. I just want to see what you guys know if you're picking up the little extensions and thinking about your distribution. So kind of like I have at, had people ask me, give me practice problems. Run through every distribution you know on problems and try it. Work them out. You know? So you can change the disk as easy as I can change the disk. David? So we're supposed to realize that um, just look at the lambdas in the uh, Poisson mass function that it looks like now. Yeah, that's it. You recognize it. So it's like if I were to imagine this thing as a function over gamma, does it have a familiar form and there's something that strikes you immediately? It kind of looks gamma. So there's a big hint. If I multiply a gamma through, would it still look gamma? It kind of does. Keep in mind the sampling distribution is not gamma, it's Poisson. It's totally different. These are counts. So these are numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3. This is a number that lives between 0 and infinity. If you want to include the, the left end point, you can, but it makes the distribution degenerate, so they exclude that. Otherwise, you're just putting a point mass at 0. So the gamma distribution looks like this. I'll write down proportionality first. This is going to be whatever our random variable is. Let's just say it's lambda right here, because that's the context we're using it in. This will be lambda to the alpha minus lambda to the alpha minus one e to the minus beta lambda. And if you want to flip over your beta, if you did it that way, that's fine too. So it kind of changes the, what the answer looks like a little bit, but you can convince yourself it's exactly the same. So there's some normalizing constant stuff in here. So this is going to be beta alpha, gamma alpha. It doesn't help you to know that for this problem. It does help you to know that for some other problems. So this is just this part right here, the kernel. So the likelihood looks like this. You don't need to express the full likelihood to understand the answers to these problems. David's right, all you have to do is stand, stare at the sampling distribution. You can recognize it with one data point, what the, the likelihood look, or what the, what the conjugate prior will be. Well, let's just write down the whole likelihood. This isn't bad practice. It will never lead you astray. So this is going to be product i goes from 1 to n, lambda xi over xi factorial e to the minus lambda. So I'll just write this down as lambda sum of the xi's. i goes from 1 to n. e to the minus n lambda. That's the only part that really matters. That's the kernel. This is a function over lambda. So I'm quite relieved we can throw this part away. This is all just a constant right here that doesn't depend on lambda. This lambda, this is a function over lambda. So I can just get rid of that. I can multiply by any positive constant. Most importantly, I hate taking factorials on a computer. It freaks me out. So it means that if I actually use the factorial function and somebody gives me some data, they could break my code real quickly if I just use the factorial straight up. Because computers have a hard time computing numbers and it could potentially be huge. Now I'm multiplying huge numbers into huge numbers potentially. The XIs don't even have to be that huge, like 50 will do it. And so it'll, it'll break your code. So I love it. Just get rid of it. Don't even need it. So the posterior distribution 
is just this. e to the minus n lambda, so that's likelihood. And then I've got prior. Lambda to the alpha minus 1, e to the minus beta lambda. Keep in mind, I have to think about these as just general parameters that get updated. I can't pick a specific value. So if I pick beta as 1, when it slides through the likelihood, it will no longer be 1. So I have to keep that as a general parameter and just think of this as a function over these things instead of a specific parameter. So if I pick, like, for instance, that to be 0 or that to be 1 or something like or yeah, that to be 1, it would change the answer. And it wouldn't slide through and be that same constant in the posterior. So you want to work with the general forms to identify conjugacy. So this thing just looks like lambda sum the xi plus alpha minus 1 e to the minus lambda beta plus n. So just combining terms. And I recognize right away which gamma this is. It looks like this one. I call that alpha tilt. I call that beta tilt. And so this thing right here is a gamma with parameters alpha tilt, beta tilt. So the idea in the conjugacy example is you're just updating the parameters that underlie that distribution. That's kind of a nice thing. And if you knew what the expectation of this thing was, you'd almost be done. So does anybody know off the top of their head what the expectation of lambda is here? Alpha over beta. Say again. Alpha over beta. Alpha over beta. If you did work in the form where beta was upside down here, it would have flipped this over. You don't need to know that part. It's not important. And it would be alpha times beta if you work on the, the other scale. So it just flips over as well. I like it on this one, so I'll just leave it there. So that means that the expectation here is just lambda given x alpha tilt or beta tilt. So same thing. We can identify what that looks like. That's just sum of the xi's plus alpha divided by beta plus n. And this is converging right here to x bar. And so there we go again. We see some central limit theorem thing, but not quite. It's converging to that. So the Bayesian and maybe a maximum likelihood person would kind of be close to agreeing except the Bayesian is incorporating some penalty. And you might be thinking alpha and beta should be relatively small for this analysis. Which alpha and beta are optimal in some sense? We need to talk further about that. But you're inclined to think alpha and beta is small. It turns out most people, and I don't want to freak you out too much, so don't dwell on this now. Probably shouldn't even have said that. Um, a lot of people will take alpha and beta to be zero. Okay. Is x bar. But for the full blown answer, you'd leave alpha and beta in there for kind of a general thing to talk about specific conjugate priors. So the prior with alpha and beta is equal to zero is not the conjugate prior for, per se. It's when you have arbitrary alpha and beta in there, not just zero, zero. So because when you slide that through the likelihood, it still won't be zero. It won't be zero and zero. They get updated with the data. So, so you need the, the arbitrary form, and then at the end of the day, you start thinking about how would I pick these. Anybody have a problem with picking alpha and beta equal to zero in this example? It's not a distribution. It's not a distribution. Yeah, you caught this the other day. I was thinking about your question from a review session that the chi-squared at zero degrees of freedom is not a distribution. But the same thing applies to the Poisson as theta goes off to infinity. That's not a distribution either. So, and nothing's a distribution in the limit. How somehow things become a distribution. So that's kind of cool. So now I think it's not that surprising after thinking about it <laughs> for all evening. So that's how you do these problems. So it's not meant to be hard, but again, it's, if you know the distributions, you can recognize them. It's 
It's like three minutes. I didn't ask you to actually perform any math. So I want you to know your distributions, know their expectations, things like that. You don't need to know your mobile generating functions, so you can free up some RAM. Um, does anybody know what the variance of this thing is? Alpha over beta squared. Yeah, that's it. It's alpha over beta squared. So very good. So just knowing these things will help you out. I think that that's at least like 30% of this class. If you know it, it just gets you over this huge hump. So then your distributions, know what gammas are, they can help you out in this class. Fair enough. So I'm just going to look over. I'd just like to see who knows this stuff, where everybody's at. But I do imagine a fair number of you probably got here and were like, I don't know what a gamma looks like. So those of us that are seasoned pros and we've taken probability theory recently are going to have a link up on people that saw it five years ago. So again, this is just to kind of make a point to your distributions. So in spirit of Bayesian analysis can be a pretty easy thing to, to carry out. We need to give you more properties, tell you properties of this estimator, why it's good. And so we're not there yet. That's all chapter seven stuff. So we're just slowly cutting into it. Okay. Thank you for indulging me. doing this. I think it keeps people on their toes and they probably learn a lot by getting challenged, come back, see the answer, and then you're ready to do it. <coughs> so if I ask you a problem like that on midterm, I'm expecting it'll be easy if you know the distribution. So that's what I'll be thinking in my mind. You don't know the distributions if you can't do it. So, which is not a great sign. So, so far in this class we've taught We've touched gammas and all their constrained versions. So because it's a subset of a gamma, we've touched normals, we've touched uniforms, we've touched betas, we've touched binomials. Um, what else have we touched? T. Yeah, T is cool too. I like T. So then plus on. So it's in there. So write those down and just study. I'm not going to give you a note sheet where you write down your distributions and know them. I personally just don't like that because it, it gives you an opportunity to not know distributions which you want to recognize quickly. So later on, you don't want to be sitting there just, I don't know what distribution this is, I'm looking it up, because you'll already forget why you're even solving the problem. David? Um, yeah, the uh, distributions that come up once on the problem, those don't need to be Like what? Uh, Logist yeah, okay, the logistic distribution you do not need to know. So a good indication is I don't know it. <laughs> so, but no, you don't need to know every single thing. That, that'll be fair game for a yes, no, maybe session next week, which distributions, and I'll try to be really specific about it. So no logistic. Any other weird ones come up? Because she's a T1, so fair game. Yeah, and I would remind you, and I'll keep reminding you, coaches are deep ones. So, yeah, fair game. Okay, cool. Let's do some set. Go back to being happy. <laughs> so again, I'm not going to penalize you for practicing. So I'm just going to make sure that you're here and doing the practice, and that's how I feel about it. We feel the same way about the homework. So even if we're giving you indications that there's room for improvements, I feel bad sometimes because I see wrong answers, but I think the insight is great and I can see why it worked out. So we have one example like that in the homework that we marked off a point. But the more I think about it, if you know the likelihood principle and things like that, you know it's going to work out right, but you use the wrong argument just because it's not the process. So um, one of you might know what I'm talking about there. But I probably should have given you bonus points, you know, for just being insightful and doing it different. So I, I'm kind of impressed also when I see wrong answers, but a lot of aptitude for understanding, well, this probably will work out, you know, and it's close enough and it can kind of work for, for reasons that you might not be aware of. Bill? Are we that more back before? Yeah. 
Yeah, Mohammed's supposed to come back by at 950 or so, and we're going to hand it off to them. So that's the point. So my, my goal is to get it as, as we exchange them back and forth, either a day before or a, on the same day. So Mohammed said he'll be here. Cool. Let's do some sin study. This is where we were last time. We're just kind of evolving this data distribution. So I call it the beta binomial example. If you want to call it the binomial beta or the Bernoulli beta, fine. So, um, but you understand where those terms are coming from. Most people just call this the beta binomial example. And the book uses this example quite a bit. This is very similar to your homework simulation. I'll be going over that on Wednesday with you so that you can be prepared to spend a little bit of time over the break on that. So here's our example. These are my hyperparameters right here, one and one. And I, I let true probability be one because that's what Alan wanted last time. He's trying to break my code. I love it. Like if you can break the professor's code, you must know what's going on. It didn't break. So there's one. The prior is flat. Beta 1, 1 is a uniform. So first draw is 1. So P is the likelihood of function. I saw another 1. No surprise. What do you think the next draw will be? A 1. <laughs> kind of cool. So. It'll slam right into that eventually. It's always going to bend, but it's going to feel like a kink as you're getting closer and closer. But it's always bending. But it's going to bend so much that it'll eventually look like that. So that's what's going on. So the posterior is kind of evolving to something. How normal does that distribution look? Nothing like it. So that's kind of cool. I guess I can say something cool about that. Um, the normal approximation wouldn't be quite as good. Do some other. So let's make this number something different, maybe 0.7. And use the uniform prime. You see what that, that did? It was kind of like bouncing around, and then it all of a sudden turned into this other thing. So you see a lot of flexibility on the posterior. It's not just a formula, it's kind of doing something reasonable. So somebody tell me again why. It's not just peaking right at that number. This is the truth. The only place I'm using that is in simulating the data, not in the inference and in plotting. So why isn't that right over? Variation in simulation. Yeah, it's just the variability of the data. So there are better answers out there than what the best answer from the data that gives you, but you'll have no way of knowing. All you've got is the data at hand. So the likelihood will peak around here, right here, or around where the data is, and that's what's happening. So it peaks around where the data is located. Let's do this again. And I think you're starting to see these asymptotics from the central limit there kicking in that x bar is driving this. And this will limit to a normal distribution. And if you take it in a GLM class, generalized linear models, they talk about all this stuff. And frequentists invoke all this stuff, that it will go to normality eventually. And sometimes they just want to jump the gun and say, well, it's normal. Let's just do it. 
The probabilist will say that's not right, it's in the limit, and I'm expressing theory, and the person that's doing stats and inference and trying to learn is gonna use that result and just assume that it's normal, maybe a little quicker than it is normal. That will eventually, it's going off the screen. So, but you can see it's peaking. And if I end up just taking n to infinity, so here's my asymptotic argument, this will collapse down to a point. The likelihood function will collapse to a point. But that never actually happens. So if I wanted to say the best asymptotic argument I have is if n goes to infinity, I know the truth anyway, so who cares? So I do understand the argument of taking things to the limit in your mind where you can see where things break. And so in the limit, everything goes well, but then you also have to back out and say, well, how does it really work you know, for a, for a finite data set? So I want to just point out that the Bayesian is condition on, conditioning on the actual data size, and their distribution is evolving under that data size. That's kind of cool. So it's a different way of thinking. And this might lead to something that's relatively normal. But I also like that it always adheres to these bounds, 0 and 1. So it's got that built in. And the likelihood is what's pushing that, not the prior. So the likelihood is the driving force in all of this. The prior is just constant. This is maybe what Fisher would have used. Said, just multiply by 1. It's really appealing. I will point out, it's very very hard to tell the difference here. But that's what the simulation study on your homework is gonna be about, is playing around. The beta half-half is an optimal frequentist prior in the sense that the posterior intervals that I would collect out of it are optimal. Let me say what I mean. Let's run that again. So I'll just point out, now the likelihood in the posterior, let me go a little bit slower. things happening is that's what randomization is. So it could be over on the end. 5% of the time it might be on the end or something like that. Lining up in the middle as I get more and more data, I see everything converging. So that's kind of cool. Um, let's just slow this down just a little bit. I'll step through this. So there's the prior, right here. So it kind of has this penalization on the boundary points. I want to point out this is relatively flat in the middle. So if P was in the middle, this would be acting a lot like the uniform prior in the middle, but near the end point, it's very different. So let me just point out if P were zero, or very, very close to zero. Let's make it not zero. Let's make this a real thing where you're doing science and every once in a while you see this little blip in there and you see something that's non-zero. So let's imagine that T is like 0 0.01, 0 0.001 if you will. And if you want to make it smaller, you can. Um, if I computed the MLA, let's say off of 31 data points, so CLT should be kicking in for me. So I got 30 data points and T is 0 0.001, I simulate everything and I get a bunch of zeros back. So I just get a vector of zeros. And I say the MLE is zero. The MLE is X bar, the mean. So the mean is a bunch of zeros is zero, so that the mean is zero. In the variance estimate, P hat times one minus P hat divided by whatever. So divided by N. Take the square root, you'll get the standard error. Well, p hat is zero, multiplying by one, it's still zero, so the variance is zero. So the CLT sort of argument says, oh, the answer is zero with variance zero. And you can walk over to somebody and say, I'm positive about all of that. And you're not, because you haven't seen something. So the Bayesian doesn't want to say zero right here in this sort of thing. So they want to put a little bit of penalty on that and say, I don't want to run into a situation where I'm saying it's zero. So they might add just a little bit to it. 
And you've maybe seen some of these schemas with like logistic regression, where there's these heuristic ideas where you just add two successes and two failures to everything. Two is too many. So that biasing things towards a half a little bit, two and two. So balanced on both sides, two zeros and two ones to everything. And that's not quite the right idea, but I, I like the spirit of it, penalized. This is like adding a half data point to each side, a half success and a half failure. And somebody has proved once upon a time that the intervals you get out of the posterior distribution, so what I would do is I'd chop off a little bit here and a little bit here. I'd probably go for the highest density regions and not just chop off this symmetric two and a half percent tails because that distribution is not symmetric. But those intervals would cover the truth more often than you would get from a central limit theorem argument. So you'll notice that the uh, likelihood is that straight line right there. That's just P. But the posterior is bending already, and it's because of that prior effect. So there is a big departure between the likelihood and the prior with one data point. The prior has some weight, and it has some say, but it's basically just penalizing you to say, be careful about the, the zero thing. Over here, it does slam that into zero. So can't be zero. We saw a success. I already know that's zero, and the likelihood is telling us that part. So it's only zero that one part of function. I do it again. See another success. That thing bends a little bit more. We keep doing this. We finally saw our zero and it flex. And one thing you should be noticing is that likelihood function is getting closer and closer to the posterior. So as I see more and more data, the likelihood is concentrating and taking over the inference. So this is the argument you'll hear asymptotic Bayesians maybe make that they say the prior doesn't matter. That in the, in the limit, as long as I place positive mass on the truth, if you exclude the truth and put zero mass, you'll never learn it. Because if I multiply it to the likelihood, it will never update because I'm just multiplying by zero. So that's what I call political priors. So I already know the answer. Do not try to change my mind with data. How ridiculous. I've already got my answer. So make sure you place mass over the whole possibility of ranges you want to consider. And make sure you consider anything that's even remotely possible. Um, and you'll do okay asymptotically, but again, as n goes to infinity, we're going to learn the truth, and it's not the prior, and it's not Bayes that are doing that, it's the likelihood function. So I want to keep expressing the likelihood function as the important thing. And penalties and constraints seem like good ideas as well, especially around boundaries. So, and eventually, it will converge to the same thing, and the effect of the prior will wear off. And it's wear off relatively quickly. So some Bayesians are interested in coming up with the maximal rate of wear off of the prior, where the prior washes away as I get more and more data as soon as possible. That's what the reference analysis is about. So it's a calculus of variations problem. We won't do one in this class. But I'll, I'll tell you some things about it. That this beta half half prior is the reference prior. It's also the Jeffries prior, if you're familiar with it. And it's also just so if you want to know more about that, you take a full book amazing class. We could spend time talking about it. But I want you to be aware of these things. So right now, we're just know about conjugacy. It's fairly easy to carry out the analyses. And so this is just a precursor to what you would learn in a full book class. So that's what the, the thing looks like, and it's becoming more and more normal. Um, another thing to just kind of point out, there are bad priors you could pick. There's good reason to think that the hyperparameters should be the same as each other, because that'll build a beta distribution that's symmetric. And we probably don't want to bias one side or the other. But if I knew that maybe um, somebody flips coins with, they have loaded coin, they have, what do they call it? Uh, Two-sided coin, a one-sided coin. I don't know what they call it, but that they've got loaded coins. I guess that's what you call it with dice. And then you have some bias to it, and you might think, well, Scotland has all these coins laying around. I don't, I have a lot of dice for 
demonstrating these sort of ideas, but we'll just think about an imbalanced coin. So I'm putting 10 times more weight on successes than I'm putting on failures. I could do that right there. And that's what my prior looks like. But this is 10 times more weight on the failures than successes. And it's going to take a long time for that likelihood to take over the prior. So don't do anything crazy. So the idea is you probably want to diffuse your prior. And so good priors are usually diffused across the grammar space. So, so this is a, a heavily influential prior. And we'll point out that the variance is also affected by how I scale this. So it's even worse if I crank this number up. So I'm going to multiply that by 10 and I'll multiply that by 10. And this is even worse. It's going to take a long time to move away from those prior weights. So you don't want to do things like that. And I think that this is what people might have been thinking Bayesians might do, is, well, you could just come up with any answer. Likelihood's over here, and you're saying the answer's over here, and no sensible Bayesian would do this. So I do like pictures like this when I see people try to exemplify Bayes. Uh, I've seen this picture around the department a lot where people will try to do something, usually it's normal distributions, and they'll say, oh, the likelihood is here, the prior is here, and the posterior is there. And it's like, don't show them a picture like that, because nobody would actually do that. Those are nice, pretty, pretty distributions. I have seen them in logos for different schools, for instance, where I'm like, whoa. <laughs> you know? So Duke uses it as their logo, one of their logos. Bill Gettles. Um, but anyway, somebody gets an idea and they're like, this looks cool. I guess that's cool. That's what a logo is supposed to be. So, um, so you probably don't want those numbers cranked too high. They need to be relatively low. So that's just a little bit of intuition. Okay, I think that's enough about that, the simulation. Um, you'll have plenty of opportunities to play around with that, and I'll discuss this at least one more time before we're off to the break. Zach, you've got a question? Yeah, so if going too high is bad, why can't you just divide by 100 or something like that prior to make it better? Well, that's effectively like what the... Uh, so, so there's a sweet spot? There's a sweet spot. Yeah. And we probably need to know more math, but if I taught you what the Jeffries prior is, it's transformation invariant, and give you a better reason for liking this prior, you can drive it fairly easy. But yeah, there's always a sweet spot in there, a little, like, too much diffusion and um, too little diffusion. We'll say for location parameters, you want to diffuse, like, as much as you can in these flat priors. So some of these priors will be improper, they're so diffused. But again, a Bayesian isn't concerned about the prior. They're not going to do inference off of it. They're concerned about the properties of the posterior. Also, for the one-half, one-half example, you said that it was, like, and values of zero and one, mm -hmm. or like the shape of the prior, so like it had more density by zero. Yeah, so that's a penalty, right? I'm up, wait a minute. <laughs> so I, I'm actually reinforcing it. Right? So I'm putting weight on it, I should say. So maybe that's that inverse penalty you're thinking of. It actually means upweighting it. So maybe I can say that as well. But yeah. So it upweights it. It says, don't make it zero. Don't make it one. Don't say things like that. So don't make it zero. Don't make it, like, bring up those numbers. Don't say that they could be zero because you didn't see that data yet. Very good idea. If you use flat priors for trying to learn things around um, zero or one, you're do a terrible job. And so if you penalize just a little bit, you'll do much, much better. In the simulation study, we'll show you that. It's cool. It's fascinating. So then you get into all these questions. What's the sweet spot? And I think once you're at that breakthrough point, you're already a Bayesian. So you're like, this is kind of cool. Let me figure out where the sweet spots are for my analyses. I will say just in terms of engineering, play around with the numbers that you're using. If you wiggle them around and do a sensitivity analysis and your answer highly depends on that stuff, you're already in trouble. Muhammad, speak of the devil. Just have a seat and we'll turn in, we'll, we'll turn back to Marks in just a couple minutes. 
I want to switch gears and get into the sufficiency principle. So the sufficiency principle says, if t of x is a sufficient statistic, then any inference about theta should only depend on the data through that sufficient statistic. So an example of this in the Bernoulli example would be x bar. Or a mean in a normal distribution, the, the sufficient statistic will be x bar. Um, I haven't told you what a sufficient statistic is. It is. It's just an idea. So here's the definition. If Tx is a sufficient statistic, then the distribution, and I say this in words at first. So there's a paragraph here, and it says this. T of x is a sufficient statistic in the distribution. I'll just call it f of x given t of x. So this is my whole data set, x1 to xn. And this is just a function of it, the data set. If this is equal to a constant with respect to data. So again, the xi's are coming from some model like this. So I'm collecting data. This isn't necessarily, it doesn't need to be IID, even though I'm kind of writing it that way. But I've got some sampling model right here. So if I can formulate this conditional distribution and show that it's constant with respect to the model parameters, i.e. this function does not have the model parameters in there, then t of x is sufficient. And I looked at this and I read, of course that's true. Okay, I didn't say that. I didn't understand it at all. I get what is sufficient. I get that. That makes sense. It's intuitive. That's what it should be. And I don't lose any information. It's still has all the information. So this is a stat, a function of the data, and it represents a reduction in the data, is the way that the book presents this to you. So it reduces the dimensionality of that n-dimensional vector. So x bar, for instance, is one-dimensional. has lots of information about lots of parameters, not all of them. Some of them it doesn't have any information about. So we can start asking those questions too. Which statistics have information? Which statistics have all the information? Which statistics have none of the information? I think it's more important to start with which ones have the information. Um, so I didn't understand that at all when I first read it. And I didn't quite understand what they were doing in the proof either, even though I was convinced I could sit down on a test and regurgitate everything. But I wanted to understand it. So let's just think about an example. So this is the example we've been looking at. So I could say um, f of x given p, so this is going to be the Bernoulli example, xi's are coming from a Bernoulli p. And I could write this thing down, and this is just product i goes from 1 to n p of xi, 1 minus p of xi. And we might be inclined to think x bar, or some of the x's, I can transform one to the other, it's a one-to-one -one relationship, so if one has information, the other one has all the information. So I can also look at the binomial. So I might be inclined to think that some of the xi, some of the xi's, is sufficient, it is. We'll see that in a second. This thing is just n choose some of the xi's. P to the sum of the xi's, one minus P to the sum of the xi's, n minus sum of the xi's. So we know what these two distributions are. So the question is, is what is that distribution? given both of these things. Anybody have an idea? First, what you need is you need to look at this distribution, f of x, and t of x, and probably condition on p, 
and then divide by f of t of x given p, the monoparameters. So p is theta in this case, in our example. What is this distribution right here? I just want to think about this, and maybe this is a function of p or not. If this doesn't depend on p, then it's that distribution right here. So if this is not a function of p, then I wouldn't write the p in, and I would have this. So this is just a conditional distribution. If I remove that right there, this is that conditional distribution. So we're really just trying to figure out if this thing right here is not a function of p. What is this joint? How do I build it? Let me ask you this. If I knew all the variation in the x's, so this is modeling the variation in the x's and in t of x, if I already have all the variation in the x's described, do I have all the variation in t of x described? Yeah. So that's the thing that controls the variability in the statistic. If I know how the variability in the xi's are described, then at least in principle I understand how the variation in the tx's are described. It's just a transformation of variables. If I know the x is, then I have a one-to-one -one with t of x, or I have just a mapping to t of x, not one-to-one. -one. I have one direction of it. If I know the x is, I can compute t of x. If I know t of x, I might not be able to produce those exact x's. So I have something different. So this is really just f of x given t. It's the exact same thing. No added information by sticking in a statistic. So there's no extra information just by computing something. You can just do it automatically. That's just a functional evaluation. And so the variation is described by the underlying x's in that process. So this joint is that. So I would have appreciated it if they said it differently, but that's just me. I would have liked them to just write down if the ratio between these two things is a constant, but it's the exact same thing as expressed in that conditional probability. So really, we're just asking if the ratio of the sampling distribution to the ratio of the sampling distribution of the test statistic is a constant. And really, it's just asking the question, are these the same functions in terms of the p, in terms of the p's? So do they have the same shape? So we already know that that thing has the exact same shape as that. And so ultimately, they're the same shape, so they have the same information. So really, for our example, this thing right here is just going to be p sum the xi's, 1 minus p to the n minus sum of the xi's. That's just this part right here. I did the simplification. Oh, this is 1 minus sum of the xi's there. There was a 1 there. Half of you knew that. Let me know next time. So that's the same thing there. So that's that Bernoulli sampling distribution. And this one is just n choose sum of the xi's, p to the sum of the xi's, 1 minus p to the n minus sum of the xi's. So this conditional probability is just the ratio of the two distributions. That's what it is. And I wish they would have said that. If the ratio of the two distributions, the actual data and the statistic at hand, that ratio is a constant. That means they have the same shape, so they're giving the same information about p. I like to think of that as the likelihood function, but I understand why not everybody would enjoy that argument. But it really is. They're the same shapes, and p and all that stuff cancels out. So at the end of the day, this thing right here is just 1 over n choose some of the xi's. So this doesn't have p in here. And so all this is the distribution, if I didn't know anything about anything, and this is the distribution of x given t of x conditional on p, but it doesn't have a p in there. So I can just get rid of that. No p shows up. So that means it's sufficient right here. Let me just ask, what distribution is this? So this is that distribution for the binomial example. It's a uniform. I want to point out when you read through the two experimenters, 
example, when they say experimenter two can draw from a distribution and collect samples, in the binomial example, they would draw from this uniform distribution. And that would represent a uniform draw over all the vectors of ones and zeros so long as they sum up to some of the XIs. And those have the same information. We're going to come back and talk about a slightly different example that's more complicated. And then we'll walk through this proof. That's it. Bonnet, do you want to help me disperse? So I think we're going to hand out your homework, and I'll see you on Monday. Say what? Good man. David Roy Michael Cloud.